Good evening. This is Strange Love, and I'm your host, Cami Chaos. Welcome, babies. Good evening, and welcome to the tech edition of Strange Love Live. I'm your host, Cami Chaos, and as always, I'm joined by Dr. Normal. Hello. Before I introduce our guests, I need to go on a little bit of a, a reflection, a remembrance, because when the show first started out, it, it, we were interviewing other bloggers that I knew through the, you know, vast series of inner tubes. Um, that made no sense. That's okay. But when we first started having Portland tech folk on the show, Dr. Normal said to me one morning over breakfast, you know what would be really great is if we get that guy Raven Zachary on the show sometime. <laughs> <laughs> That guy, you know? And I said, yes, maybe. Maybe someday. Maybe. I don't know. Well, that someday is now. And we have Raven Zachary. Hello. And James Keller. You have to say hello, James. Hi, everyone. That way everyone is familiar. As uh, I believe it's Todd has pointed out that Raven is a man and James is a woman. It's true. Yeah. Apparently that's confusing for some people. Yeah. <laughs> now we can get past all that and we can talk about the team raven that's being built it's like a superhero kabbalah or something what are you doing well okay stepping back for a minute um was at uh, mac world when steve jobs announced the iphone this mm -hmm. was a january of 07 and you know have always been fascinated by mobile technology and for me as an apple fan uh, this you know pocket pervasive technology you could take everywhere and be on the internet and uh, started doing a number of events over the course of 2007. Early on, uh, launched an event series called iPhone Dev Camp, which uh, was uh, sponsored by Adobe in San Francisco. We had 400 attendees and really promoted the iPhone at, mo at that point as a kind of a web development uh, uh, platform mm -hmm. at the time before the App Store and all of its native applications came out. And uh, you know, then we saw Apple embrace native applications in late 2007, and then 2008 was an, an amazing year uh, for the platform. Did another iPhone dev camp sponsored by Adobe again in the summer of 2008, and then helped uh, a local company, Palatial, launch their iPhone application mm -hmm. uh, nearby, which is still available in the, in the App Store. It's a free app. And uh, then was contacted by the Obama campaign in August to direct that initiative uh, uh, to build the official Obama iPhone application and uh, partner in crime in the audience here, Jason Grigsby, uh, played a, a pivotal role in that project. A team of 10 uh, led by Jason and I. It was a, a combination of, of Portland uh, talent as well as uh, folks in the Valley and uh, John White, the lead developer in, in South Carolina of all places. And uh, you know, from that, a series of events, a lot of really great leads, a lot of opportunities in the space to build essentially what is an, uh, an agency model around mm -hmm. the iPhone and work with large brands and innovative ideas to bring amazing new uh, opportunities to the platform. And uh, it was pretty clear very quickly, you know, transitioning here to, to James, that to build an agency and to really embrace this opportunity beyond just doing development, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have, we have uh, opportunities to really help brands engage with their customers and with, with the opportunity in the market in, in a way that's, that's much more like an advertising agency model than a development shop. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had, uh, you know, needed some advice from an expert in uh, interactive agency work and so went out with coffee uh, with James to get her advice on hiring a project manager. And I'd say probably three or four minutes into the conversation, it was pretty clear that I needed to be talking to James about James, uh, opposed to getting her advice on career. So we had a pretty intensive, this was what, three weeks ago? Uh, four. Okay, four weeks ago. And uh, you know, showed the showed the lead pipeline, all of these amazing clients that we had. I mean, stuff I would love to talk about on the show that because of client confidentiality cannot, but everything from the music industry to high fashion to re large retail, a lot of a lot of agency work, a lot of you know in you know big advertising, um, and some n really neat stuff uh, in the pipeline. And uh, I think the fact that James is probably equally as obsessed with her phone as myself. And the fact that it really was a very much comparable, I think, in terms of the scope and the opportunity that she was having it. Here, I'm speaking for her. Uh, I'll stop <laughs> in a minute. Uh, that she was doing at Wyden and Kennedy. Um, you know, we really, uh, we, we think that this thing is going to be uh, really big. Uh, the platform itself, obviously, the iPhone. 
But beyond that, I think the opportunity for uh, uh, for Portland and for specifically our our, our uh, new endeavor to really you know be put on the map pretty pretty strongly uh, in this space. So instead of, I'm just gonna you know paraphrase a little bit, not even paraphrase. I'm just gonna make sure that I understand it properly. You're not. You are developing things, but it's not about the development. It's about making the the interface friendly, and and have, helping the companies to get it out there to people in a friendly way. Yeah, and it's also strategy. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I do I do some advisory work in the investment community of mm -hmm. VCs down in the valley, uh, up in Seattle, uh, looking at investment opportunities, new business models in the space. We're talking about a whole new economy that's being built around this platform. This isn't just Apple and a set of consumers. This is Apple, a set of businesses, mm -hmm. and then this very broad international market. Um, I'm going to stop talking now and let <laughs> let James here talk about uh, about it here. Yeah, I, I, I think you guys, you, you paraphrased really nicely. I mean, if, if you see sort of what's happening with big brands in the space right now, you've got a lot of uh, businesses making some really questionable decisions in terms of apps. I think mm -hmm. one we've spent a, a lot of time talking about is The Gap. They built this absolutely beautiful application that, you know, got into product and you had a great store finder and it was holiday themed. It came out in December. It was beautiful. And then holiday season went away. They pulled the app from the store and you can no longer through a nice, beautiful app interface actually find a Gap store if you're a Gap, you know, fan. And so these are the kinds of mistakes I think we're seeing. And so really what we're coming in to do is making sure that as brands are trying to find their space um, in the mobile world, that they're making smart choices and making applications that are going to make sense for their consumers, add actual value, little more than the shtick. I mean, shtick is really nice. It's yeah. fun when you can sort of show off an app at a bar and you get some buzz. Yeah. But really, it's about connecting the brands with consumers in a, in a really meaningful way. Something that's more entertaining than just, oh, I know where it is, and oh, look, it's closed now. So really, they just had it for the holiday season? Just for the holiday season. And if you still have it on your phone, that's great. But if you found out about it in January and you wanted, and you were on a trip and you wanted to find out where the local gap was, you couldn't use the app to do that. You couldn't get it from the store right now. So... I was just going to say, um, is this... So is this like the mojo behind the Obama app as far as trying to get that user experience? You know, what are is what you guys do basically, I have an iPhone, I'm going to go into an application, and here's what's going to happen to the user. Yeah, I would say um, there's three things that I think that we're looking at in terms of business opportunity now. Obviously, the first and the most obvious is building apps for people. A lot of people have great ideas. There's a shortage of talent in this space. Uh, and they come to people who have had apps and, and successes that they can kind of prove it out. Uh, that's interesting work. It's not, I think, the work that James or I or the other team members have as a long-term vision. I think that there's opportunities around strategy, helping companies understand the model, helping them build businesses, and then uh, also user experience. How do you do excellent design? How do you have an engaging user experience on the phone? How do you build something effective that's long-lasting that can reach a large audience and be the kind of app that people are going to use past the first three or four weeks? There's a very strong drop-off in usage. People download apps, short attention span. They try it for a couple of days. And then I think that the, you know, it's a very, very steep drop-off. And yeah. you know, how do you keep people engaged, especially in the brand world, uh, where there's so many different voices uh, you know, trying to gain your attention and uh, you know, how do you build compelling apps that have long-term use? Do you think that, uh, you said there was a shortage of talent. Mm -hmm. Do you think part of that is because in, in the grand scheme of, of the computer world, it's not really a short period of time that the iPhone has been out, but, yeah. but in the business world, I mean, that is kind of a, a short time for people to learn to adapt to that and say, oh, maybe it's just gadgetry, it's gonna be gone soon. And obviously iPhones have really managed to take hold. I love my iPhone. <laughs> um, do you think that, you know, it, it's just uh, adapting their mindset to this completely different way of thinking? Because normally, even with a laptop, you, a business isn't going to want to design an application that, do you, I'm not phrasing it very well, I think. Um, it, it gives them a, it's a completely different opportunity. It's something that we haven't had before. It, it's a space, I think, that people don't really understand. I mean, for so long, mobile has been such a sort of stunted user experience where Funky. all people wanted to do on their phone was 
call and text. Mm -hmm. And the great thing that the iPhone has done is really brought the web browsing experience sort of into something that's enjoyable and manageable and really creating these beautiful, rich native apps that you can do amazing things. Um, and so I think it's a real game-changing device. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there's a real opportunity. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Little sound effect there provided by Cami Chaos. Thank you. <laughs> So I think there's a real opportunity to do something different. And the thing that we love about it is it's a game-changing device in that you can change the way people experience the world around them. A great example, I don't know if you've seen Shazam, but if music is playing, you hold the app up, it tells yeah. you what's playing, and, and suddenly you have you know, this different experience of the world. And so if you can really sort of bring that sort of innovation to consumers in a meaningful way under a brand umbrella, mm -hmm. that's a really, really interesting opportunity and one that people haven't really fully explored, I think, in, in the brand world. I also think uh, one of the things that we'll be seeing over the next couple of years is internal applications. I mean, I think as you see people around you, you know, using this device more and more, just like the BlackBerry is a real business tool, I think you're going to see the iPhone becoming a, a more useful business tool. And so I think one of the things that, that we'll be exploring at least at some point in the near future is is how to do that from an internal perspective as well as, you know, sort of a brand push outward as a part of your advertising or marketing platform. So let me, the, the two points I think were, one, the best application is useful whether it's under a brand umbrella or not. Mm -hmm. And it's just to get a brand to use something that's going to be user friendly and good anyway. Yep. And that it's going to move on so that, say, a large corporation can design their own application for their employees and for their users. Exactly. I mean, what if you were on the road and you had a great intranet app where you could communicate with the rest of your company? Um, you, you just had something that you could look. Oh, what if? Click. What, what if? if? <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? It's, they, there are things out there, but I think we're going to start to see much, much more sophistication in that realm, and I think that's going to be really exciting. And then in terms of um, out to the consumers, I think you see a lot of the apps um, that are with big brands right now out there in the app store really about being sort of campaign-focused initiatives, mm -hmm. which is really usual as you've got the advertising. Advertising usually works in campaign pushes and not long-term brand value. So I think you're going to start to see that, you know, the traditional advertising model is a peak of media dollars where you've got TV and print, and then it drops off, and then you'll see it come back up. You can see interactive and mobile in particular sort of leveling out those peaks and valleys. So so that's that's what I was thinking. Like, I was thinking of the Obama app model, where it's like it's for a certain time period, and you get a large spike, mm -hmm. but then the campaign's over, whether it's a political campaign or a marketing campaign, yep. and then you're done with the app. Like you were saying, the attention span is, is on mobile devices for apps is very, very low. Yeah. I mean, is that, say I'm... Mr. Big Corporation, mm -hmm. an apparel, you know, Dr. Normal's jeans, okay. <laughs> okay? Do I have one app that you download and that you keep with you for six months or a year or two years, or is it multiple apps that you get a spike, you run a campaign, the app's over, loses interest, it's done, and then we're on to the next new style, the next new campaign? So um, I think we'll, we both should answer that because we come from different perspectives. I don't have an agency background, and I don't generally have, have spent a lot of my career working with big brands. So everything I've learned has kind of been I'm in specifically the talking about attention span attention on the mobile span. device. So I would say that um, if your Dr. Normal's uh, apparel company had a large, uh, broadly distributed retail uh, sector, you know, if you had storefronts, uh, you're going to want to have longevity in the way you reach your customers. You're going to want to have a, 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 an experience that helps people come into the store and you know increase their sale amounts. Um, the, you know seasonality is okay. If you want to do a Christmas line and a spring line, bring that content into the app, refresh the app. I think one of the challenges with mobile applications, specifically the iPhone, is an app is released and they're not updated. Um, you know you spend a campaign set of dollars on an app. It's the app is launched and then the team that built it moves on to the next project. And there's not that dynamic experience for customers to stay involved in the app and, 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 and to have value. Generally, when you look at the branded application space right now, they fall into three categories, utility, novelty, and games. Audi has a driving game for their A4. You have novelties like the Zippo Lighter. And then you have utility, apps like a store locator that helps the, the customer come into the store and, and do purchasing. So 
uh, you know, I, I think that uh, you know the, the kind of the campaign-based apps tend to be in the novelty and in the in the gaming space because you have a set amount of dollars for a set campaign. That money is spent, and then you know, move on to the next set of problems. I think utility, you know, long-term engagement with brands to their consumers is going to be a space that there could be a lot of innovation in. Mm-hmm. Well, I can see where the you know the the store locator app is going to be something that oh, okay you keep that on your on your mobile device and you know that's that's continually updated, right. but with a a game for maybe a game around a certain product or product line is going to have a a short longevity. It's not necessarily. I mean, where does the long tail apply here to a mobile app, right? It's not necessarily the long tail. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I think you're going to have, I, I think you're going to see both, and I think there is value in both. Um, so I think the A4 game is a great example. I think you'll see a lot of people who have used it, loved it. They got a lot of PR buzz. You know, there was a lot of noise about it, and people did use the app. I mean, I had several people come up to me and say, did you see this? And there is value in that. Three, four months down the road, I don't think anyone's going to be talking about it. I think most people will have wiped it from their phones. On the other hand, you look at somebody like Amazon and their app, um, you know, it's really basic but really great. I mean, you've got your shopping cart, you can do e-com, and then they've got that innovation space as well that you can take a picture of something, they feed it through their Mechanical Turk service, and people identify that object and help you purchase it. And so, I mean, that's really interesting use of the space that I think really is the long tail. If you shop at Amazon, that's an app you're going to keep on your phone, and it's an app you'll use again and again. So where do you think the line is? Because obviously there's a ton of free apps out there, but there are apps that people are willing to pay for. And where do you think the the line is drawn there? Because honestly, I've downloaded a ton of apps to my phone and taken them off and put them on. I've only ever bought one. There's only one that I've ever paid for. Can you tell us what that is? Tweety. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm it's a good Twitter app. junkie. We're yeah. free tards around here. Trust me. <laughs> no, no. And there's a lot of great free con- free apps out there, so I can understand. That's right. That's that, uh, right. Tweety is a good buy. Yeah. One of my favorite things about this new job is that I get to buy apps, and I actually feel justified in doing that. <laughs> I've purchased more apps in the last three or four weeks than, than I care to admit. But, yeah. um, you know, I, I think if you're looking at the brand space, I think there is a place for brands to charge if they're bringing you something really great. But really... It's out of the marketing budget, the development of that app. Most times, I would say those apps aren't about developing a revenue stream mm-hmm. unless, for example, you're EA and you're making a game. Mm-hmm. You know, then you right. can, and you know, you're seeing them experiment with what the right price point is. Um, but I think for, for most uh, consumer brand apps, those will probably come at a, a free pri- price point. And hopefully, as they get towards more valuable um, apps and less shtick, I think it's just going to be gravy for it for those of us who are just consuming yeah now as a counterpoint uh we have one great example of a of a paid brand app which is the crafts recipe app and it's done very very well Mm -hmm. and i think a lot of people are looking at that as a potential model so Mm -hmm. we have marketing spend but how could we then also generate revenue to recoup the costs of of the development initiative so i don't think crafts going to be the uh the uh, the main uh, model that mm-hmm. we're going to look at. I think more of the maybe the promotional based kind of get the app out and build brand. Um, that's going to be more of the model. But the craft one is interesting uh, mm-hmm. that they've able they've been able to monetize what essentially is a brand affinity application. Um, uh, so now we get in that we get into all these different possibilities, and you're talking about apps that you can purchase like games and things like that. And we see in traditional media, as we like to call it on this show, old media, which Mm -hmm. it's no dig. It's just the traditional Mm -hmm. linear media out there, broadcast media, movies, product placement. Mm -hmm. So is there a synergy with someone who's developed a game who wants to sell their app and then also get a little juice on the side, so to speak, with product placement or or relating this particular game back to product placement like you're talking about the Audi the uh, driving game I mean are we seeing those things emerge or do you see those things emerging you want to take that one or? well there is um, there is a model now for embedding advertising into into apps and it's it's an alternative model to charging um, there's a big debate now as to whether I'm thinking about one of my free Twitter sure, apps that's sure, the, absolutely. Um, I can't remember which one it is. It's uh, Twitterific, I think, yeah. which in the free model, it embeds 
ads yeah, in the tweet absolutely. stream, which I, is, I find, perfectly I, acceptable. I would encourage everyone who has an interest in this space to go to pinchmedia.com and read Greg Yardley. Uh, he's the CEO of Pinch Media. They're a well-known iPhone analytics company. To read a recent piece, I think it's two days old, about um, some new data he's harvested from the analytics data around uh, paid apps versus advertising-based apps. And he made he made the case, I think, fairly compelling that, um, you know, if you're on the fence about charging, you know, a buck or two bucks for an app versus uh, putting in ads, uh, the safer bet's probably to charge, unless you're looking at, you know, a million plus users, that the uh, the CPM rates on mobile ads are so low that the economics around around dollar apps um, or two dollar apps are far more compelling, um, and that's direct money to you. There's not, you know, two middlemen in this case. You know, Apple takes thirty percent. Uh, in the case of, an, of a free app, you've got you know the mobile ad provider in the middle, and their rates uh, may adjust, and their take may be may be higher. I actually think there is a model for 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 ads, especially in games like Tap Tap Revenge, which have five million plus users. Um, there's such a large base there that ad inventories are probably going to be you know at higher CPM well, rates. I, I don't want to call it necessarily ads as much as the oh, product content product placement product placement model, okay. right? You know, like we see in. Like I said, in TV shows yeah, and movies, you or know, video oh, games, I'm drinking right? a Pepsi or something. Yeah, there was right? a well-known racing game that had Obama uh, uh, campaign posters as you drove through the the race circuit. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think I think in general you're seeing a trend towards product placement, and whether it's traditional media or interactive media, you you dealt with this for a living. So. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, any time that you can get your your stuff in front of people in an in an environment that um, is appealing to them. I think there, there's extreme value in that. And I actually think the sort of amazing sweet spot in the Apple world right now is um, if you can be one of those icons on the iPhone commercial, it's amazing what it can do. I, I'm lucky enough, my, my brother is actually um, an iPhone developer as well, and he did a little, a little app for his daughter, and it happens to be the icon right next to one of the the icons of the app they open on one of the current commercials. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's amazing just the spike that he got from that alone. Um, So it's one of those things that I think right now apps are really vying for um, that spot in sort of the Apple world when Apple is doing product placement. If you can be one of Apple's apps, I think you're you're super lucky. So rather than search engine optimization, it's visual engine optimization <laughs> for a lack of a better term right it, it's not uncommon now for people to um, cheat the the uh, iTunes search engine and say you know people who like this app also love and sure. then they list the top sure. 10 apps and the top 10 bands and the top 10 movies in hopes that you happen to be searching for Something. you know the new Brad Pitt this, movie and this show drives a lot of traffic to this week go. in tech by the way <laughs> we just can, uh, I want you to know that you know? <laughs> So yeah, I think that kind of gaming is probably going to, uh, you know, these, these loopholes in marketing are going to be, um, you know, resolved by Apple. But right now, it's uh, certainly not the case. So do you think, on this conversation, you talked about the direct advertising, and then there's the product placement. It sounds like because that's kind of softer and and more friendly. Does the product placement have a bigger effect without people realizing it? Is it more like subliminal? Are people less upset that they're being advertised to in that way? No, I, you know, I think when, when people see certain apps within other realms or people see a product within an app, I, I think there's a lot to be said for affinity, right? I mean, when you're doing uh, tradigital, uh, tradigital, that's an old <laughs> heritage word that I use that's for awesome. like banner advertising. But, I um, like tradigital. <laughs> I can't say it right, but I like it. <laughs> but with, with also with traditional media, you know, when you're looking at placing a a magazine ad, for example, I mean, we talk a lot about passion points. So, for example, if you're doing a product marketing teen boys, it makes sense to advertise on, you know, gaming blogs or in sports magazines. And so, and the reason that you do that is you're going to get better affinity rate. And it's not necessarily that anyone's going to spend a tremendous amount of time looking at your ad in that magazine or on that blog, but suddenly there's this brand association between, you know, whatever it was you were advertising and a topic that the person was passionate about. And so any time that you can sort of relate those things, um, even if it's not really, you know, up front and in your face, but just sort of in the background, I think there's a lot of value in that. And that's, I mean, advertisers have been, you know, uh, working based on that model for a really long time, and because it works. Oh, I want to. I this 
half hour is going so quickly, guys. <laughs> and that's what happens when you have really smart people <laughs> sitting you. here in this basement, <laughs> which is what it is. But um, I, I did want to ask about the platform. Um, obviously, we are all you know referencing the iPhone. Mm-hmm. Tell, predict the platform this year, 2009, 2010. Right now, I, I'm sure you know, you're know you all focused on the iPhone. Everyone's looking at the iPhone. It's right. the, the leader. But Android, um, the Palm Pre, mm-hmm. uh, Windows Mobile somewhere there um, as well, um, all these other devices are still out there. Are you guys looking at that? Do you see momentum in that area? Or are you just still focused on the iPhone and then... L- see how those technologies work later? I want to get your answer, too. Let me, let me, <laughs> throw, some sta- let me throw some stats at you. Um, 17. Please do. So <laughs> We're a statistics show. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. Um, there are somewhere between 20 and 30 million devices right now that run iPhone OS. That includes the iPhone and the iPod Touch. Um, those are staggering numbers when compared to other new mobile platforms like Android. Android has several hundred thousand uh, by you know latest counts. Um, you know I have no complaints about the Android platform, nor do I have complaints about the Palm Pre. But I think people um, vastly underestimate the the value of a head start. Um, just this week at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, the other mobile platform players came out and announced their commercial app stores. And today, Google launched theirs on on, on Android. You know, 18, to 18 months late, up to two years late, based on what Apple has done. When Apple released the iPod in 2001, it was late to the game. And in a matter of four or five years, it captured 80% of the mobile music market. I don't think you're going to see that with the iPhone. But um, Apple has two things that the other guys don't. They have two-year head start, and they have their secret weapon, which is the iPod Touch. No other mobile platform out there has both a mobile phone operating system paired with a media operating system. You have millions and millions and millions of college students who have iPod Touches um, and kids and, you know, uh, you know, full spectrum demographics and it's the same operating system i can run the same apps on my ipod touch than i can on my iphone and that combination is so compelling i think uh you know you know a year from now um you're going to see apple dominance i think i think that you know this whole new wave of smartphones this whole new wave of mobile platforms um apple has a two-year head start and the secret weapon which is the pairing with the ipod I think they have another secret weapon as well, and it's it's maybe it's brand friendliness. I know mm. people completely outside of the tech world. I know people who are afraid of their computers that have iPod touches. Well, and I, I and who look at my iPhone and say, "Is it any different?" I was talking to a woman just the other day, and she was she had her son playing with her iPod Touch to keep him occupied while her daughter was in a class, and she asked me a hundred questions about my iPhone, and my my answer was, "It's the same thing. I can just make phone calls." Well, and I I, I was going to say you. You made the statement, which I somewhat disagree with, that Apple came late to the the MP3 player market, correct? And I would say they, they came at the right time, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, there were other MP3 players before Apple came to that market, but they, they you know, you, you're either an early adopter right. or you're at the right time, and Apple, you know, being the experienced company that they are, mm-hmm. obviously had the hit, so... I, I, you know, it's funny thinking about what you were saying. I mean, uh, one of my favorite business books, and for the life of me, I can't remember who wrote it, but it's called The Innovator's Dilemma. And it talks a lot about how being the first to market with something great isn't always an advantage because right. ev- everyone goes out to copy you, and, and I think you're starting to see that now with the launch of the other app stores. That's, that's what I worry about. I mean, there's a lot of people in Taiwan right now who are – who are trying to catch up, and they're right. very good at catching up mm-hmm. at a lower price point. Yep. But, you know, I have to say, I think Apple does have a really uh, compelling price point, and a, and a combination of what you were both just saying, uh, you know, with, with the iPod Touch being the secret weapon, and sort of, you know, you, you mentioned um, the woman who gave the, the touch to her child. I mean, I, I have a three-and-a-half-year-old, and uh, before I was on at and I had an iPod Touch. I was a fan of it. Now it's my test device, and it's his gaming platform. Kid's three and a half, and he's playing Dizzy Bee. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. And the thing that speaks to me about that, uh, you know, I, I do a good job of trying to sort of 
temper that because I don't, you know, it, it's a little scary. But it's amazing to me that a three and a half year old can pick up a device, use it, navigate between apps. I mean, it is so intuitive that from a very early age, he just knew how to do it. And, and so I think um, you'll see that people get used to that experience. And while I think people will sort of try to come in and emulate what Apple's doing, Apple is unique in their ability to bring really joyous emotional uh, connections with consumers in a way that, you know, Windows has been trying to do for years and, and never completely been able to emulate. So um, I, I'm a believer in the platform because I think Apple has done such an amazingly beautiful job. Yeah, speaking about games, I mean, my kids have had PSPs, they've had Nintendo DSs, and I can't remember the last time they booted theirs up. It's all <laughs> iPhone and all iPod Touch. That, that's what they want on the weekends when we let them game. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, a, that's the bad example for Apple, is Sony, right? I mean, that, that's, that's what, you know, before Apple and before Apple, you know, Sony was the mobile player. Mm -hmm. Sony, I mean, and if you go back years and years ago, back to the Walkman, Walkman. I had one. and all that, I mean, they were the mobile music device. Absolutely. Yep. And uh, now they're struggling. Mm -hmm. so. yep. mm -hmm. On that note, we're out of time for the tech episode and we need to wrap things up. But if you'd like to stay tuned for the after hours, we'll have more with Raven and James. I think we'll and have a lot more. Yes. <laughs> I have a feeling we'll have a lot more talking to do. And please join us next week when we have John Nastas on the show. Good night, everybody.